Uh, all right, so our next talk of the day is from Leonie Watson. Um, uh, this is one that I have selfishly been very, very excited about. Uh, I feel like uh, we've danced around the topic of accessibility and performance and being able to measure the performance impact of some of the things that we're doing on the accessibility from the perspective of the accessibility tree and things like that for years. Leonie was saying, I think it was, what, 2019? We said, so yeah, this is like four years at least we've been talking about trying to figure something out. Uh, and nobody knows this better. Um, also, highly recommend uh, reading and subscribing to uh, going back through the archives, really, of your blog for years. <laughs> the one in particular that stands out is there's one about writing uh, alt text from the perspective of like being a very emotive with it and descriptive <laughs> with the alt text, which completely transformed the way I think about that. So uh, everybody give a hand for Leone. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, it will come as no surprise to you to hear I'm going to talk about performance. The surprise may be in the accessibility bit, because I am not going to stand here for the next 30 minutes or so and tell you not to use React slash Vue slash name your JavaScript framework. As Tim's uh, research into the subject will tell you, there are plenty of good reasons for being careful about your JavaScript when it comes to performance, but accessibility actually isn't one of them. So. Let's think about what we mean by web performance. This won't come as news to, well, any of you, I'm thinking. But we're going to, for the purposes of this talk anyway, frame it in terms of the time it takes for the document or documents to be downloaded and displayed in the browser to the point where the user is able to perceive and start interacting with them. So quite a familiar description of what we mean by web performance. Most of you, I'm sure, will also have heard of the critical rendering path. If you haven't, bear with us for a few moments. If you're familiar with it, I'm going to talk to everybody else because I really hate talks and tutorials and online things that kind of assume I know far more than I do, and that happens to me quite a lot. So uh, give me a minute. I just want to explain this. When we load up a document, or the document gets loaded up in the browser, the HTML gets passed, and the document object model, the DOM, starts to form. If the HTML queries or requests some JavaScript, and that has an impact on the DOM, then the DOM might get slightly re-architected. If the HTML, as it almost always does these days, of course, has CSS referenced from it, uh, then the browser takes that and separately builds the CSS object model. Browser keeps going then, and it brings the two things together, the DOM and the CSSOM, and it combines them into a, a tree, a rendering tree. This is all the information now together. Then the browser starts to think about layout, uh, the location and the size of different objects on screen. And then finally, we get to the last bit of the chain, the paint bit, where you get all those lovely pixels on screen. You can see stuff, and you can start pointing your mouse at it and interacting with it. So paint, that's an interesting phrase from my point of view because I can't see. So actually, sorry designers, I don't care about your pixels for the most part. I'm sure they're beautiful and they really do the job, but for me, yeah, not so much, I'm afraid. So at the risk of putting you all to sleep, I know Tim mentioned some napping tendencies, I want you to close your eyes just for a few seconds because my experience of the page is not the time to paint, uh, it's the time to, what can I call it? vocalize, and this is how the page that's shown on screen sounds to me. Heading level one, latest posts, article, heading level two, link, thoughts on skin tone and text descriptions, December 15th, 2021, list of one items, web life, list end, article end, article, heading level two, link, Patrick H. Law. So clearly, there's another step involved when it comes to accessibility, certainly uh, accessibility for screen readers, the software that you just heard speaking the content out loud. Sorry. Ah, there we go. And the answer to that is something called the accessibility tree. So actually, it's another structure that the browser creates alongside the DOM, the CSS object model, all of those other things. There's this thing called the accessibility tree. And its closest parallel is the DOM. So where the DOM is a tree hierarchy of all the content and other bits and pieces that get shown on the page, the accessibility tree is the same thing, but it's all the accessibility information about what's in the DOM. 
So I can explain that in a bit more detail. Uh, you've probably heard the phrase semantics. In accessibility, it's particularly important because semantics, the information that's available about different elements and objects on screen, is pretty much the core feature of my experience as a screen reader user. And there are three bits of information that are really relevant to this. The first is an element's role. Now, most HTML elements have an implicit role, which is a very fancy way of saying, as developers, if you're just writing pure HTML, you don't need to do anything other than write the HTML. The role gets provided implicitly by the browser. And the role tells someone like me what the element is pretty much like your role does. You might be a performance specialist or a front-end developer or a designer. Uh, that's your role, and it tells someone something about what it is you do. So if we take a very simple example, a button element, you just write the HTML, same as you always would, and the browser implies that this has a role of, well, button. It's not very surprising, any of this. And that means my screen reader, when it encounters this information, can ask the browser, what's this element? The accessibility tree will store its role, and what I hear in return is... Button. That simple. So it's really, really easy, but we keep building on this information. We get uh, an element's accessible name. This is uh, sometimes the bit of content that goes inside a link or inside a button. It can be the alt attribute on an image. Uh, it can be the label that's associated with the form field. It comes from all sorts of places. But like, my name is Leoni, uh, Tim is somewhere around here, PPK, we've all got names, and they're how we tell each other apart in a crowded room like this. Uh, it works the same way. If we have lots of links on a page or lots of buttons, the accessible name is the bit that helps us tell one apart from the other. So if we extend that really simple button example and put some text in the middle of it, uh, then the information my screen reader gets from the browser and then tells me is this. Show password button. So it's great. I now know that there's a button on the screen and what it's for. Visually, of course, this would probably be very apparent to anyone looking at the screen, but now I've got access to the same information. The third bit and the last bit is state, uh, what condition the element happens to be in at the time. Uh, conditions here apparently are leaning towards having a nap, but hopefully I am doing something about that. Conditions of elements can vary, of course. Uh, form fields can be checked, for example. Uh, some of them can be disabled. But in the case of our show password button, what we might want to do is actually just show if it's been pressed or not. And here's where we move into explicit semantics. There isn't a native HTML attribute or element that will let you express when a button is in a pressed state or not pressed state. So here we can use uh, another markup language called ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and specifically an attribute called ARIA pressed. When it's true, several things happen. My screen reader tells me that the button's pressed, but it also changes the role a little bit. Instead of being button, it becomes a toggle button, and that gives me more information about the purpose of the button. I know I can toggle it on or off. Show password toggle button pressed. So this is all the information, whether it comes from the HTML implicitly or explicitly applied through ARIA. This is what gets stored in the accessibility tree in the browser. Lots of information. So I mentioned the screen reader can get to the information in the accessibility tree. This is where the performance starts to get really interesting. Now, this is a terrible example, but it's a really good illustration of how adding that accessibility tree into the critical rendering path can make an incredible difference to my perceived time to interactive. Enter. So that's the page being requested. Six regions, 354 headings, and 6,095 links. Now, <laughs> 6,995 links. I mean, who really does that these days? Um, the irony of this being an accessibility spec is not lost on me either. Um, but I said it was an extreme example. But you know, you will have seen. I'm guessing, you know, when the uh, the page, the paint happened, and then you know, the gap between that and me first hearing that the content had loaded is is you know, it's eight, nine, ten seconds. And we know in performance that you know, a wait of a second is enough to turn people away from a website and make them go somewhere else to get the job done. So you know, this really does feel like an eternity. And trust me, standing on stage every time I play that video, it's like, oh god, have I played the right thing? But it's, you know, it's a really big wait, and that's the experience. So let's go back to the mechanics of all this. Uh, screen readers and other assistive technologies use platform accessibility APIs to query information out of the accessibility tree. 
Uh, these are not JavaScript APIs. They're not ones you can use as developers. They are, as the name suggests, just available on the platform. All platforms, happily. Um, Microsoft has got two or three, UI Automation, MSAA, IA2. Uh, Mac OS has them, iOS, Linux, and Android as well. And these are the API that a screen reader can use to say to the browser, give me some information because I've got a user here who needs to know something about what's on screen. I'm going to take a slightly different pathway through now and just take a look at browser architecture. Again, I know this will be very, very familiar to most, if not all of you, but it's just worth going through again. Back in the day, browsers used to use a single process, which is to say everything happened in the one process. The application, the bits you clicked on, the bits you interacted with, the content, the whole nine yards was all in the one process. It's screen readers were in there too, if you happen to use one. The result was that they were just catastrophically unstable, never mind insecure and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, what really made it terrible from a screen reader user's point of view is that if the process crashed out, it not only took out your browser and that one process, it usually took out your screen reader as well, which left you completely, well, blind, to coin a phrase, uh, and unable to do anything. Often, you had to reboot your computer to, to kind of get around that. Fortunately, browsers have all now switched over to using a multi-process model. It's separated out the content process from the application process, and lots of good things have come from this. It's much more stable, much more secure, and screen readers, too, have changed the way they fit into this. And there are two different ways this can happen. One is in-process communication, which is to say the screen reader effectively lives inside the application process, so it doesn't go anywhere near the content process at all. And API calls using the accessibility APIs are sent from the screen reader to the application process, um, and that then sends it over to the content process. Content process is where the accessibility tree lives, grabs the information, sends it back, and the screen reader gives me all the information like we were hearing just now. Then there's out of process communication, and this is also an architecture used today. This is where the screen reader lives outside of both the application process and the content process. And so the screen reader says to the application process, please make this query. The application process makes it to the content process, grabs the information, and then the whole lot gets reversed back to the screen reader. So we've got two reasonably different architectures when it comes to screen readers and the way they interact with browsers. So look back a little bit in history to Internet, 7, Internet Explorer 7 and older. This is an example where it was still using a single process. So the screen reader existed inside that one process. Uh, the advantages were it was really quick. Um, the screen reader pretty much had instant access to everything in the content process, so it couldn't have been faster. But as I was saying before, it was incredibly unstable, and if it did blow up, it, it blew things up pretty catastrophically. So we moved on from that. I'll come on now to Chrome and Firefox. Now, both multi-process architectures, of course, so uh, they have some similarities, but they for the time being at least, do things in slightly different ways. Chrome initially took the approach of proxying all the API calls. So where the screen reader was inside the application process, it followed the process I was mentioning just now. All the API calls got sent through to the content process, did their thing, and then got sent back. What they discovered was is that this is actually quite resource intensive, and therefore it's not really that performant. Um, and, and they were right, it was very, very slow. So they switched to a different approach. What they do now is that they proxy or they cache the whole of the accessibility tree. So it gets created in the content process, then they copy the whole lot over to the application process where the screen reader is, and of course the screen reader now can just get its hands on everything it needs to really, really quickly. The impact is that sometimes there can be a bit of a performance hit when the page first loads because it does take a bit of time for the tree to be created and then cached over in the application process. That's only on very, very large and, dare I say it, JavaScript heavy websites. Sorry, I said I wasn't going to mention that, didn't I? Um, but after that, things are lightning fast. The performance is really, really excellent because the screen reader and the accessibility tree effectively live in the same process. Firefox is interesting. Uh, their current approach in their shipping version is very similar to the initial approach that Chrome took. They proxy calls across from one process to the other, but they use what they call intelligent caching. This basically means when an API call is made, uh, for example, to 
get a, the contents of a P element. Uh, the intelligent caching says, get all the information about the text inside that element, but also grab some things you think the screen reader user might want to know anyway, like uh, the font style and size, or whether something's bold or italic, for example. So it still has performance problems, but it does sort of minimize them a little bit by using that intelligent uh, you know, proxying. So it's kind of OK is really the best that you can say about it. If you happen to use the screen reader JAWS, unfortunately, it's a hell of a lot worse. Um, the, the, those two are not, not friends in the current shipping version, particularly when it comes to performance. But <laughs> the future approach, and it's really almost with us, actually. It, Firefox are switching over to the same process uh, or same approach that Chrome uses. Uh, basically, the problem Firefox had was when they switched over to their multi-process architecture a few years ago, uh, they kind of sort of crammed a bit of an edit into their accessibility engine. Uh, and it never really had the same kind of quality of performance that Firefox used to with screen readers. Uh, they've actually now rewritten the whole of their accessibility engine, and uh, it's now available behind the flag in uh, Firefox Nightly. So if you happen to be a screen reader user, and you happen to use Firefox, which I very much do, uh, then you can go and enable accessibility cache in the settings. And it's incredible, um, because now we've suddenly got you know, Chrome-like performance in Firefox, which, as I say, for me as a habitual Firefox user, is, is really good news. I believe they're hoping to roll this into shipping sometime, maybe towards the end of this year to next year. Um, with something like this, they want to be very cautious about it, of course, if you start really breaking screen reader users' ability to use your browser. It's not, not, not a good look. So they're being cautious, quite rightly, um, and looking for feedback. So if you do feel like testing this, I know the team there would welcome it. Let me move on to Safari, because we focused on Windows quite a bit so far um, in terms of screen reader relationships. Uh, Safari uses out-of-process communication. And although this might seem like it's going to have you know, a real performance hit, that screen reader to application to content and back again process. It works actually surprisingly well in Safari. Um, it's, I think, probably because, you know, Apple owns the whole ecosystem. And when they own the platform, when they own the browser, and they own the screen reader, um, they have a much closer kind of symbiotic relationship with each other. And, and so they're just able to, you know, really give it that performance edge. It used to be the same with uh, Microsoft's Edge before it switched over to using Chromium under the hood. Uh, it had the same kind of thing. Narrator is the built-in screen reader on Windows. And if you use Narrator with the original Edge browser on Windows, um, it used out-of-process communication. But again, it solved that performance issue. And I'm assuming, again, it was the, the ecosystem coming to the rescue. So back to our rendering path. Uh, we've got what we might call our accessibility critical rendering path, which is pretty much the same as before. The uh, HTML to the DOM to the CSS object model to the rendering tree to the layouts to paint, and we add on the end instead of paint the accessibility tree. There is something worth mentioning there, uh, and that's rendering the accessibility tree. Actually, all browsers do this a little bit differently, but there's a few things I just want to mention because they're quite important when you come to think about how to improve your own performance. Screen readers or the accessibility tree, uh, the creation point for that is really about the time the DOM starts to get created. Um, much of what the accessibility tree has in it is, is based on what's in the DOM. So of course, if JavaScript requires a re-architecture of the DOM, that triggers the accessibility tree to be rebuilt again. What you might be a little more surprised to discover is that actually layout is uh, a trigger as well. Uh, much as I was uh, dismissing the values of CSS and styling earlier, uh, there are a few CSS properties that do make a difference to the way screen readers perceive content. The obvious example is display none. If you hide some content with that, you're hiding it from everybody, screen readers as well. So anything that gets picked up from the CSS object model built into the rendering tree and then uh, you know, ceases to exist during the layout stage, that too can trigger some changes in the accessibility tree. So as with all kind of good performance recommendations, minimizing the amount of updates and changes you need to do in this, this pathway is equally applicable, if not a little bit more so, when you're talking about accessibility. Trouble is, it doesn't really stop 
there. So far, at least, we've been talking about the browsers and their architecture and where the accessibility tree fits in and how screen readers get information to it or from it. But there's another piece of the puzzle that has to be slotted in, particularly for Windows screen readers. This doesn't apply to macOS or iOS. Screen readers grab lots of information from the virtual buffer, uh, sorry, from the accessibility tree, and then they create something called a virtual buffer. Now, this is a screen reader only um, uh, architecture, if you like. And the reason is that screen readers have a lot of keyboard shortcuts for doing things. Uh, we need keyboard shortcuts to read sentences, words, characters, to spell characters, to navigate by headings, tables, lists, list items, graphics, uh, divs. Uh, frames, pretty much any HTML element you can think of, there is a shortcut for a screen reader to navigate by. And that's only possible by actually interacting with this kind of virtualized version of the web page. If you've ever used a screen reader, you'll know that these use up most of the letter keys, a good number of the number and punctuation keys to boot. And so when on a Windows screen reader you enter into a form, for example, and you want to go back to using all those keys for their intended purpose, you'll often hear an audio feedback, like a thwock noise or something. And that's the indication that the screen reader is saying, OK, I'm, I'm going to stop using that virtual buffer, and I'm just going to go back to basics and, and interact with the browser directly. So the creation of this has uh, an impact on a user's ability to interact with content too. So here's a reminder of what that heading navigation can sound like, for example. Latest posts, heading level one. Thoughts on skin tone and text descriptions, heading level two, link. Patrick H. Locks Goulash, Heading Level 2, Link. Notes on Synthetic Speech, Heading Level 2, Link. And one thing you'll find if you ask almost any screen reader that drives them absolutely wild is when the performance load time, whatever, of the page is so slow, the screen reader is trying to be helpful and it will start building that virtual buffer. And it happens to me an awful lot. I'll start navigating through a page. It might be by headings like that, or it might be by landmark regions, or you know, other big sort of markers of content that I've got a shortcut key for. And I'll just settle into, say, reading an article on a news site when the page will finish loading, and everything just gets shunted around. My keyboard focus goes straight back up to the top of the window. And abruptly, mid-sentence, I've got to start navigating my way all the way down the page again. And that's a really bad user experience problem in terms of performance. If we could figure it out so that we could make the whole thing just a little bit quicker and a little bit more efficient, um, that kind of sort of broken experience really wouldn't happen, shouldn't need to happen. So perceived experience is really important, and little things matter. Uh, from the browser's point of view, it's little things like deciding whether you inform the user uh, that something is focusable, what its role is, or some other information about it. Just the order of something relatively small like that can make a really big difference to the perceived performance and time to interactive for a screen reader user. From a code point of view, it's all the stuff you know about already, about really you know, optimizing your code for performance and, and making sure that you know, your rendering path isn't doing anything unnecessary to, to cause the browser to use up resources it doesn't need to. And then we get to the other metric in that opening uh, description of performance. Uh, objective measurements. And this is the issue that, that Tim mentioned in Lighthouse. A uh, conversation that started on Twitter became an issue saying, can we add something to Lighthouse's metrics that give us a way to, at least in a very basic sense, record what time to interactive looks like for a screen reader? Sounds like maybe would be a better phrase. Um, it needs people, certainly with better browser chops than I have, uh, to help out with some prototype ideas and other bits and pieces general feeling from people who know far more about performance than I do is that this should be achievable. Um, we just need some help, which is why I'm mentioning it here, because you are all exactly the sort of people who we may be able to call on for some help. So if you're looking for a side project, head over to this issue and take a look and, and chime into the conversation. It would be good to have some more contributions. Practical steps are really, as I've mentioned a couple of times now, do all the good things you can for performance. Just Really, really try hard to do them. Uh, you know, learn about it more from you know, MDN or you know, whatever your resource may be for documentation. Use Lighthouse, get your, your general kind of performance metrics best as they can be, because essentially your performance is what has the most impact on accessibility performance. If 
the website's performance is lousy to begin with, then it's going to get worse from an accessibility point of view. If it's good to begin with, then you're giving you know, the accessibility part of that story a big advantage. So yeah, no surprises there, but just a really big plea to keep doing it as much as you possibly can. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonie. Uh, here, right. have a little bit Thank of time you. for those. Cool. Are we going to wood? Yeah. I mean. Gosh, I have to move that a little bit better. Mm. Right there. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Do this without falling off, because that'd be just perfect, wouldn't it? <laughs> right. There we go. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, thank you for that. I think it's, it's always, I, I just get fascinated by stuff that comes at performance from a different angle than maybe that we're talking about um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And things like the, um, I'd always thought about it in the timed interactive stuff, but what you're describing with the virtual buffer, that feels like the speech, uh, that, that feels like the equivalent of like a layout shift, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, that's basically what you're describing is everything is shifting out from underneath you as you're trying to do something. Uh, yeah, that's the experience. That's what it feels like very much. That, yeah, yeah you, you think you've settled into a page that's there and finished loading and is all ready, and then suddenly you realize that you weren't. <laughs> yeah. So I know you mentioned, like, you know, a, a few things around, like, you know, generally speaking, if it's bad for perf, you know, it's probably not ideal here and trying to minimize the amount of work that you're doing and stuff like that. But um, have you seen other, like, any specific gotchas in terms of, you know, things that are particularly problematic when it comes to disrupting the accessibility tree or impacting the buffer usage? ARIA actually is probably the worst thing I've seen, which you know you might think, well, that's designed to help accessibility, and, and it is when you use it really, really cautiously. Um, the problem is, is that um, with the absolute best of intentions, we quite often see front-end developers going, I've got an accessibility problem. ARIA will fix it. Um, and ARIA is actually really, really powerful. And, quite a lot more complicated than people expect. And, and probably the worst thing I've, I've sort of seen for performance, oddly, is, is people doing their best to try and fix things, throwing too much extra aria they don't need, um, and or kind of yeah, doing things they didn't really mean to and having unintended consequences. So, and right now, the best way to really test that is to manually do it, correct? Like, you're going to have to fire up, like, yeah, uh, your voice-activated system on the Mac or something like that and kind of listen to what's going on? It is, pretty much, yeah. There are no tools, really, that can do this. Uh, much as I wish they were, it would make testing so much easier. But yeah, right now it would. Yeah, reader. but I know Tammy. I was thinking about Tammy's talking about like you know the regression, right? Mm -hmm. Like preventing regressions and stuff. There's nothing that kind of exists for this right now from this perspective. Uh, no, nothing really. Yep. There has been some work going on um, by a, a group called Boku um, through the W3C. It's not finished yet, but that's the problem they're trying to solve: is is some more kind of automated. How do we actually test what the screen reader is is sure. doing? Now the other side of this that's kind of it's interesting. Uh, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, synthetic and, and RUM has come up a lot here, right? Like the real user stuff and the being able to do it in the lab, but then being able to see what happens in the real world. Now, I know that's a big challenge with accessibility because there's concerns about detection and like uh, detecting somebody is uh, using a screen reader or something like that and serving an entirely different experience or something like that. Um, do you know, but it, but it also feels like at least having some visibility in terms of, like, let's fast forward. Let's say that we figure out a way to get some of these metrics to, to be able to indicate in some way, you know, at least synthetically, that you've busted through the virtual buffer and caused problems, or it took forever for the accessibility tree to be ready, or something like that. It feels like having something that we could look at from a real user perspective would be helpful. Do you know if there's anything like that being discussed or any kind of options there? Uh, no, not really. And, and you're right, the privacy is, is really the controversial thing that we've got to solve first, I think. Um, the, the difficulty being, you know, people sort of often say, oh, you know, we know what browser you're using, we know what country you're in, you know, we know all this stuff already, but none of that really tells you anything about the person Sir. behind the kind of the browser, if you see what I mean. As soon as you detect that you're using a screen reader, statistically, you've got an 80% chance that's a person with a visual disability. Um, and that gets very personal very quickly at that point. Um, and when you start, you know, I, I put this into a, a blog post not long ago. If, if I look at you know, the other browser information that's available, where my IP is located in my home city of Bristol, uh, if I then look at the average number of blind people in the UK per 100,000, uh, it basically narrows it down to there's two people in that city 
this browser uh -huh. could be used by. Yeah, it gets you the problem with this, Remarkably yes. quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that's not so good. Um, but yeah, equally, I do recognize there is a use case for, you know, offering a better experience. I just think we've got to figure out what to do with all the bad actors out there first. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. I wonder if there's a way to, I don't know, maybe even sort of add, I think there was a conversation, uh, boy, uh, TPAC, I think there was an accessibility group that came in and started talking to the performance group a little bit and mm -hmm. trying to brainstorm around like maybe the reporting API or something like that becomes an option. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a head nod here from Nick, so uh, those would be interesting to kind of explore, but yeah, that's a challenge. Um, flip flap that, okay, so on the browser side of things, um, based on your experience, is there anything that you'd like to see, like would it ever make sense for the browser itself to perhaps load resources in a different way or do some sort of different behavior when they can detect that the accessibility uh, technology is being like used, that there's accessibility tree being generated? Uh, yes, but I think they already are. Um, and that's improving the information that's available through the accessibility APIs. You know, when they were first introduced in the end of the 90s and, and were really coming into their own through the 2000s, they were really quite sort of blunt instruments. Um, they're a lot better now than they were, um, but they still need to improve. There's still some, you know, pretty big gaps in it. Uh, last time I checked, for example, UI automation, one of the, the, the Windows newer accessibility API, didn't have a way to query for all the headings that were on a page. So that heading navigation example I just played for has to be done the hard way rather than just going, give me all the headings so I can let the user navigate through them. Um, but the browsers are doing this. There's, there's work happening on the APIs and they are improving all the time. Okay. Interesting, all right. Um, you mentioned MDN and kind of digging in there and stuff like that. I was absolutely flat fascinated by the, the different approaches that the different browsers are taking and stuff like that. So if there's anybody in the audience who's like really keen, right, like maybe they just want to kind of understand this better or maybe somebody's eager to build that tool um, or like, you know, start prototyping a metric or something like that. Is that the different approaches from those different vendors, is that documented anywhere that pe is it on MDN? Is it somewhere else that people can dig in? Or is this you just doing so much homework and uncovering all of this? <laughs> I mean, this is why on my thank you slide, I, I had a few people's names. Um, Jeff Petty from Microsoft, Glenn Gordon from Freedom Scientific that made the JAWS screen reader, and uh, Jamie Tear, who's one of the original uh, NVDA screen reader inventors and now works for the Mozilla accessibility team, because it was just a lot of me bugging them with really stupid questions <laughs> that, that kind of got me to this talk. Um, so no, as far as I know, it's not, not documented anywhere. Um, uh, Mozilla has published a blog post about accessibility cache recently, which is, I suppose, a step in that direction, but it still isn't the, the kind of the proper documentation we might see on MDN. Okay. Um, how about, okay, so for testing, we know it's manual testing, but what is, do you, like, do you have a recommendation on the best set of tools? Like, if people were going to start doing that manual testing, is the, the screen reader that's built into Mac OS good enough? Is, should they be looking at trying to get a hold of JAWS? Are there services that enable this kind of thing? Um, no, the built-in screen readers on all platforms are actually fine. Okay. Um, yeah, voiceover on, on Mac OS and iOS, um, just use it with Safari. It does work with Chrome and, and Firefox, but again, back to that, it's Apple's gig, so... Uh, voiceover tends to work better with Safari than the others. Uh, Windows, yeah, use uh, Narrator. Um, if you're going to use Narrator, use it with Edge. Um, just again, ecosystem compatibility. It's the best sure. experience. Uh, otherwise, test with NVDA. It's free. It's open source. It's every bit as capable of JAWS without the multi-hundred yeah, pounds. I was going to say JAWS is, I believe, a little <laughs> yeah, pricey, right? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what I do for Chrome and Firefox testing on Windows. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it, it does feel like it's like, uh, I don't know, I think back to like when I first got into Perf, right, and like so many of the things that we wanted to measure, we were just not able to measure. And so it literally was like just working on all sorts of hacks, right? And often it was manually looking at, but, you know, in our case, it was often the film strip and like comparing different points in time, even if there wasn't a metric there, or like figuring little things out like that. And it, this feels like that. This feels like, you know, back on like, basically ground zero in terms of trying to figure out like we know that there are potential problems we don't have any way of reliably measuring those now and so it's like yeah it's going to be just a lot of manual testing from folks and digging deeper yep, unfortunately. <laughs> all right well hopefully we can change that before too awful long um, but thank you leone very very good thank you very much <laughs> thank you <laughs>